Part One of The Gray Mills of Farley by Sarah Orrin Jewett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perrard. The mills of Farley were close together by the river, and the gray houses that belonged to them stood tall and bare alongside. They had no room for gardens, or even for little green side yards, where one might spend a summer evening. The corporation, as this compact village was called by those who lived in it, was small but solid. You fancied yourself in the heart of a large town when you stood midway of one of its short streets. But from the street's end you faced a wide green farming country. On spring and summer evenings, groups of the young folks of the corporation would stray out along the country roads, but it was very seldom that any of the older people went. On the whole, it seemed as if the closer you lived to the mill-yard gate, the better. You had more time to loiter on a summer morning, and there was less distance to plod through the winter snows and rains. The last stroke of the bell saw almost everybody within the mill doors. There were always fluffs of cotton in the air, like great white bees drifting down out of the picker chimney. They lodged in the cramped and dingy elms and horse chestnuts, which a former agent had planted along the streets, and the English sparrows squabbled over them in eaves corners and made warm, untidy great nests that would have contented an arctic explorer. Somehow the corporation homes looked like make-believe houses or huge stage properties. They had so little individuality or likeness to the old-fashioned buildings that made homes for people out on the farms. There was more home-likeness in the sparrow's nests, or even the toy-like railroad station at the end of the main street, for that was warmed by steam, and the station master's wife, thriftily taking advantage of the steady heat, brought her house plants there and kept them all winter on the broad window sills. The corporation had followed the usual fortunes of New England manufacturing villages. Its operatives were at first eager young men and women from the farms nearby, these being joined quickly by pale English weavers and spinners with their hearty-looking wives and rosy children. Then came the flock of Irish families, poorer and simpler than the others, but learning the work sooner and gayer-hearted. Now the Canadian-French contingent furnished all the new help, and stood in long rows before the noisy looms and chattered in their odd, excited fashion. They were quicker-fingered and willing to work cheaper than any other workpeople yet. There were remnants of each of these human tides to be found as one looked about the mills, Old Henry Dow, the overseer of the cloth hall, was a Lancashire man, and some of his grandchildren had risen to wealth and prominence in another part of the country, while he kept steadily on with his familiar work and authority. A good many elderly Irishmen and women still kept their places. Everybody knew the two old sweepers, Mary Cassidy and Mrs. Kilpatrick who were looked upon as pillars of the corporation. They and their compatriots always held loyally together and openly resented the incoming of so many French. You would never have thought that the French were for a moment conscious of being in the least unwelcome. They came gaily into church and crowded the old parishioners of St. Michael's out of their pews, as on weekdays they took their places at the looms. Hardly one of the old parishioners had not taken occasion to speak of such aggressions to Father Daly, the priest, but Father Daly continued to look upon them all as souls to be saved, and took continual pains to rub up the rusty French, which he had nearly forgotten, in order to preach a special sermon every other Sunday. This caused old Mary Cassidy to shake her head gravely. "'Miss Kilpatrick, ma'am,' she said one morning, "'Fakes!' They ain't folks at all. Tis but a pack of images they do be, with all their chatter like birds in a hedge. Sure then, the holy St. Francis himself was, after saying that the little birds was his sisters, answered Mrs. Kilpatrick, a godly old woman 
who made the stations every morning and was often seen reading a much-handled book of devotion she was moreover always ready with a friendly joke they ain't the same at all was in them innocent times when there was plenty saints living in the world insisted mary cassidy look at them thrash now the old sweeping women were going downstairs with their brooms it was almost twelve o'clock and like the old gray horses in the mill yard they slackened work in good season for the noonday bell three gay young french girls ran downstairs past them they were let out for the afternoon and were hurrying home to dress and catch the twelve forty train to the next large town that little one is michelle's daughter she's a nice child too very quiet and has got more christian tart than most said mrs kilpatrick they live overhead o me there's nine of themselves in two rooms two does be boarders those upper rooms bees very large entirely at fitzgibbons said mary cassidy with unusual indulgence tis all the company cares about is to get a good rent out of the pay they're asked every little while by honest folks aren't they build a trifle of small houses beyond the church up there but no they'd rather the money and cape us like bees in them old hives sure in winter we're better for having the more fires but summer is the penance they all says why don't folks build their own houses they does always be talking about mike callahan and how well he saved up and owns a pretty place for himself convenient to his work you might tell them he'd money left him by a brother in california till you'd be black in the face they'd stick to it twas in the picker he earned it from themselves grumbled mary cassidy them french spends all their money on their backs don't they suggested mrs kilpatrick as if to divert the conversation from dangerous channels look at them three girls now off to spencer with their fortnight's pay in their pocket a couple of onions and a bag of crackers is all they want and a pinch of lard to their butter pronounced mary cassidy with scorn the whole town of em won't be the worse of a dollar for steak the week round they all go back and buy land in canada they spend no money here see how well they forget their pocket-books every sunday for the collection they do be very light too they've more laugh than ourselves tis myself's getting old anyway i don't laugh much now i like to see a pretty girl look fine said mrs kilpatrick no they don't be young but once the mill bell rang and there was a moment's hush of the jarring racketing machinery and a sudden noise of many feet trampling across the dry hard pine floors first came an early flight of boys bursting out of the different doors and chasing one another down the winding stairs two steps at a time the old sweepers who had not quite reached the bottom stood back against the wall for safety's sake until all these had passed then they kept on their careful way the crowd passing them by as if they were caught in an eddy of the stream last of all they kept sober company with two or three lame persons and a cheerful delayed little group of new doffers the children who minded bobbins in the weave room and who were young enough to be tired and even timid one of these doffers a pale pleasant-looking child was all fluffy with cotton that had clung to her little dark plaid dress when mrs kilpatrick spoke to her she answered in a hoarse voice that appealed to one's sympathy you felt that the hot room and dry cotton were to blame for such hoarseness it had nothing to do with the weather where are you living now maggie dear the old woman asked i'm in callahan's yet but they won't keep me after today," said the child there's a man wants to get bored there they're changing round in the rooms and they've no place for me miss callahan couldn't keep me lest i'd get my pay raised mrs kilpatrick gave a quick glance at mary cassidy come home with me then till yez get a bite a dinner and we'll talk about it she was kindly to the child i'd a wish for company the day the two old companions had locked their brooms into a three-cornered closet at the stair foot and were crossing the mill yard together 
they were so much slower than the rest that they could only see the very last of the crowd of mill people disappearing along the streets and into the boarding-house doors it was late autumn the elms were bare one could see the whole village of farley all its poverty and lack of beauty at one glance the large houses looked as if they belonged to a toy village and had been carefully put in rows by a childish hand it was easy to lose all sense of size in looking at them a cold wind was blowing bits of waste and paper high into the air now and then a snowflake went swiftly by like a courier of winter mary casty and mrs kilpatrick hugged their old woolen shawls closer about their round shoulders and the little girl followed with short steps alongside End of part one part two of the gray mills of farley by sarah oren jewett this librivox recording is in the public domain the agent of the mills was a single man keen and businesslike but quietly kind to the people under his charge sometimes in times of peace when one looks among one's neighbors wondering who would make the great soldiers and leaders if there came a sudden call to war one knows with a flash of recognition the presence of military genius in such a man as he the agent spent his days in following what seemed to many observers to be only a dull routine but all his steadiness of purpose all his simple intentness all his gifts of strategy and powers of foresight and of turning an interruption into an opportunity were brought to bear upon his dull routine with a keen pleasure a man in his place must know not only how to lead men but how to make the combination of their force with machinery take its place as a factor in the business of manufacturing to master workmen and keep the mills in running order and to sell the goods successfully in open market is as easy to do badly as it is difficult to do well the agent's father and mother young people who lived for a short time in the village had both died when he was only three years old and between that time and his ninth year he had learned almost everything that poverty could teach being left like little maggie to the mercy of his neighbors he remembered with a grateful heart those who were good to him and told him of his mother who had married for love but unwisely mrs kilpatrick was one of these old friends who said that his mother was a lady but even mrs kilpatrick who was a walking history of the corporation had never known his mother's maiden name much less the place of her birth the first great revelation of life had come when the nine years old boy had money in his hand to pay his board he was conscious of being looked at with a difference the very woman who had been hardest to him and let him mind her babies all the morning when he careful little soul was hardly more than a baby himself and then pushed him out into the hungry street at dinner-time was the first one who beckoned him now willing to make the most of his dollar and quarter a week it seemed easy enough to rise from uttermost poverty and dependence to where one could set his mind upon the highest honor in sight that of being agent of the mills or to work one's way steadily to where such an honor was grasped at thirty-two every year the horizon had set its bounds wider and wider until the mills of farley held but a small place in the manufacturing world there were offers enough of more salary and higher position from those who came to know the agent but he was part of farley itself and had come to care deeply about his neighbors while a larger mill and salary were not exactly the things that could tempt his ambition it was but a lonely life for a man in the old agent's quarters where one of the widows of the corporation a woman who had been brought up in a gentleman's house in the old country kept house for him with a certain show of propriety ever since he was a boy his room was never without its late evening light and books and hard study made his chief companionship as mrs kilpatrick went home holding little maggie by the hand that windy noon the agent was sitting in the company's counting-room with one of the directors and largest stockholders 
and they were just ending a long talk about the mill affairs. The agent was about forty years old now, and looked fifty. He had a pleasant smile, but one saw it rarely enough, and just now he looked more serious than usual. "'I am very glad to have had this long talk with you,' said the old director. "'You do not think of any other recommendations to be made at the meeting next week?' The agent grew a trifle paler, and glanced behind him to be sure that the clerks had gone to dinner. "'Not in regard to details,' he answered gravely. "'There is one thing which I see to be very important. "'You have seen the books, and are clear that nine per cent dividend "'can be easily declared very creditable, very creditable,' agreed the director. "'He had recognized the agent's ability from the first, "'and always upheld him generously. "'I mean to propose a special vote of thanks for your management. "'There isn't a minor corporation in New England that stands so well today. The agent listened. We had some advantages, partly by accident and partly by lucky foresight, he acknowledged. I am going to ask your backing in something that seems to me not only just, but important. I hope that you will not declare above a six per cent dividend at that director's meeting. At the most, seven per cent, he said. What? What? exclaimed the listener. No, sir! The agent left his desk chair and stood before the old director as if he were pleading for himself. A look of protest and disappointment changed the elder man's face and hardened it a little, and the agent saw it. You know the general condition of the people here, he explained humbly. I have taken great pains to keep hold of the best that have come here. We can depend on them now and upon the quality of their work. They made no resistance when we had to cut down wages two years ago. On the contrary, they were surprisingly reasonable. And you know that we shut down for several weeks at the time of the alterations. We have never put their wages back as we might easily have done, and I happen to know that a good many families have been able to save little or nothing. Some of them have been working here for three generations. They know as well as you and I and the books do when the mills are making money. Now I wish that we could give them the ten per cent back again, but in view of the general depression, perhaps we can't do that, except in the way I mean. I think that next year we're going to have a very hard pull to get along, but if we can keep back three per cent, or even two, of this dividend, we can not only manage to get on without a shutdown or touching our surplus, which is quite small enough, but I can have some painting and repairing done in the tenements. They've needed it for a long time. The old director sprang to his feet. Aren't the stockholders going to have any rights then? He demanded. Within fifteen years we have had three years when we have passed our dividends, but the operatives never can lose a single day's pay. That was before my time, said the agent quietly. We have averaged nearly six and a half per cent a year, taking the last twenty years together, and if you go back farther, the average is even larger. This has always been a paying property. We've got our new machinery now, and everything in the mills themselves is just where we want it. I look for far better times after this next year, but the market is glutted with goods of our kind, and nothing is going to be gained by cut-downs and forcing lower-cost goods into it. Still, I can keep things going one way and another, making yarn and so on, he said, pleadingly. I should like to feel that we had this extra surplus. I believe that we owe it to our operatives. The director had walked heavily to the window and put his hands deep into his side pockets. He had an angry sense that the agent's hands were in his pockets, too. I've got some pride about that nine per cent, sir. He said loftily to the agent. So have I, said the agent, and the two men looked at each other in the face. I acknowledge my duty to the stockholders, said the younger man presently. I have tried to remember that duty ever since I took the mills eight years ago, but we've got an excellent body of operatives, and we ought to keep them. I want to show them this next year that we value their help. If times aren't as bad as we fear, we shall still have the money. Nonsense! They think they own the mills now, said the director. 
but he was uncomfortable, in spite of believing he was right. Where's my hat? I must have my luncheon now, and afterward there'll hardly be time to go down and look at the new powerhouse with you. I must be off on the quarter to two train. The agent sighed and led the way. There was no use in saying anything more, and he knew it. As they walked along, they met old Mrs. Kilpatrick, returning from her brief noonday meal with little Maggie, whose childish face was radiant. The old woman recognized one of the directors and dropped him a decent curtsy, as she had been taught to salute the gentry sixty years before. The director returned the salutation with much politeness. This was really a pleasant incident, and he took a silver half-dollar from his pocket and gave it to the little girl before he went on. "'Cape it safe, darling,' said the old woman. "'You'll need it yet. Don't be spending all your money in sweeties. Tis a very cold world to them that has no pence in their pocket.' The child looked up at Mrs. Kilpatrick apprehensively. Then the sunshine of hope broke out again through the cloud. I am going to save fine till I buy a house, and you and me'll live there together, Mrs. Kilpatrick, and have a lovely coal fire all the time. Fax, Maggie. I have always thought some day I'd cape a pig and live pretty in me own house, said Mrs. Kilpatrick. But I'm the old sweeper yet in number two. Tis a world where some has and more wants, she added with a sigh. I got the mains for a good burying the lord be praised and a bitteen more beside i wouldn't have that if father daly was as cropping as some miss mullins does always be scolding about father daly having all the collections ventured maggie somewhat adrift in so great a subject she's no right then exclaimed the old woman angrily she'll get no luck to be grudging her pence that way tis hard work any priest would have to cape the likes of herself from being heathens altogether. There was a 9% annual dividend declared at the director's meeting the next week, with considerable applause from the board and sincere congratulations to the agent. He looked thinner and more sober than usual, and several persons present, whose aid he had asked in private, knew very well the reason. After the meeting was over, the senior director and largest stockholder shook hands with him warmly, about that matter you suggested to me the other day he said and the agent looked up eagerly i consulted several of our board in regard to the propriety of it before we came down but they all agreed with me that it was no use to cross a bridge until you come to it times look a little better and the operatives will share in the accession of credit to a mill that declares nine per cent this year I hope that we shall be able to run the mills with, at worst, only a moderate cut-down, and they may think themselves very fortunate when so many hands are being turned off everywhere. The agent's face grew dark. I hope that times will take a better turn, he managed to say. Yes, yes, answered the director. Good-bye to you, Mr. Agent. I am not sure of seeing you again for some time he added with unusual kindliness. I am an old man now to be hurrying round to board meetings and having anything to do with responsibilities like these. My sons must take their turn. There was an eager protest from the listeners, and presently the busy group of men disappeared on their way to the train. A nine per cent dividend naturally made the Farley Manufacturing Company's stock go up a good many points, and word came presently that the largest stockholder and one or two other men had sold out. Then the stock ceased to rise, and winter came on apace, and the hard times which the agent had foreseen came also. End of Part 2 Part 3 of The Grey Mills of Farley by Sarah Orne Jewett this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. One noon in early March, there were groups of men and women gathering in the Farley streets. For a wonder, nobody was hurrying toward home, and dinner was growing cold on some of the long boarding-house tables. They might have carried us through the cold weather. There's but a month more of it, 
said one middle-aged man sorrowfully. They'll be talking to us about economy now, some of them big thinkers. They'll say we ought to learn how to save. They always begin about that quick as the work stops, said a youngish woman, angrily. She was better dressed than most of the group about her, and had the keen, impatient look of a leader. They'll say that manufacturing is going to the dogs, and capital's in worse distress than labor. How is it those big railroads get along? They can't shut down. There's none of them stops. They cut down sometimes when they have to. But they don't turn off their help this way, complained somebody else. Faith, then. They don't know what justice is. They talk about their justice all so fine, said a pale-faced young Irishman. Justice is nine per cent. Last year for the men that had the money and no rise at all for the men that did the work. They say the shutdown's going to last all summer anyway. I'm going to pack my kit tonight, said a young fellow who had just married and undertaken with unusual pride and ambition to keep house. The likes of me can't be idle, but where to look for any work for a mule spinner, the Lord only knows. Even the French were sobered for once and talked eagerly among themselves. Halfway down the street, in front of the French grocery, a man was haranguing his compatriots from the top of a packing box. Everybody was anxious and excited by the sudden news. No work after a week from tomorrow, until times were better. There had already been a cut-down. The mills had not been earning anything all winter. The agent had hoped to keep on for at least two months longer, and then to make some scheme about running at half-time in the summer, setting aside the present work for simple yarn-making. He knew well enough that the large families were scattered through the mill-rooms, and that any pay would be a help. Some of the young men could be put to other work for the company. There was a huge tract of woodland farther back among the hills where some timber could be got ready for shipping. His mind was full of plans and anxieties, and the telegram that morning struck him like a blow. He had asked that he might keep the card-room prices up to where the best men could make at least six dollars and a half a week, and was hoping for a straight answer, but the words on the yellow paper seemed to dance about and make him dizzy. "'Shut down Saturday night until times are better,' he repeated to himself. "'Shut down until times are worse here in Farley.' The agent stood at the counting-room window, looking out at the piteous, defenseless groups that passed by. He wished bitterly that his own pace stopped with the rest. It did not seem fair that he was not thrown out upon the world, too. I don't know what they're going to do. They shall have the last cent I've saved before anybody suffers, he said in his heart. But there were tears in his eyes when he saw Mrs. Kilpatrick go limping out of the gate. She waited a moment for her constant companion, poor little Maggie the doffer, and they went away up the street toward their poor lodging, holding each other fast by the hand. Maggie's father and grandfather and great-grandfather had all worked in the Farley Mills. They had left no heritage but work behind them for this orphan child. They had never been able to save so much that a long illness, a prolonged old age, could not waste their slender hordes away. End of Part 3《Part Four of the Gray Mills of Farley by Sarah Orne Jewett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It would have been difficult for an outsider to understand the sudden plunge from decent comfort to actual poverty in this small mill town. Strange to say, it was upon the smaller families that the strain fell the worst of in Farley, and upon men and women who had nobody to look to but themselves. Where a man had a large household of children, and several of these were old enough to be at work, and to put aside their wages or pay for their board, where such a man was of a thrifty and saving turn, and a ruler of his household, like old James Dow in the cloth hall, he might feel sure of a comfortable board and be fearless on a rainy day. But with a young man who worked single-handed for his wife and little flock, or one who had an invalid to work for, that heaviest of burdens to the poor, the door seemed to be shut and barred against prosperity, and life became a test of one's power of endurance. The agent went home 
late that noon from the counting room. The street was nearly empty, but he had no friendly look or word for any one whom he passed. Those who knew him well only pitied him, but it seemed to the tired man as if every eye must look at him with reproach. The long mill buildings of gray stone, with their rows of deep-set windows, wore a repellent look of strength and solidity. More than one man felt bitterly his own personal weakness as he turned to look at them. The ocean of fate seemed to be dashing him against their gray walls, what use was it to fight against the corporation? Two great forces were in opposition now, and happiness could come only from their serving each other in harmony. The stronger force of capital had withdrawn from the League. The weaker one, labor, was turned into an utter helplessness of idleness. There was nothing to be done. You cannot rebel against a shutdown. You can only submit. A week later, the great wheel stopped early on the last day of work. Almost everyone left his special charge of machinery in good order, oiled and cleaned and slackened with a kind of affectionate lingering care, for one person loves his machine as another loves his horse. Even little Maggie pushed her bobbin box into a safe place near the overseer's desk and tipped it up and dusted it out with a handful of waste. At the foot of the long winding stairs, Mrs. Kilpatrick was putting away her broom, and she sighed as she locked the closet door. She had known hard times before. "'They'll be wanting me with odd jobs. We'll be after getting along some way,' she said with satisfaction. "'March is a long month, so it is. There'll be plenty time for change before the end of it,' said Mary Cassidy, hopefully. The agent will be thinking whatever can he do. Sure, he's very ingenious. Look at him how well he persuaded the directors to live off with making cotton cloth like everybody else and catch a chance with all these new linings and things. He's done very well, too. There bees no sense in a shutdown anyway. The looms and cards all suffers and the bands all slacks if they don't get stiff. I'd sooner pay folks to tend their work whatever it cost tis true for you agreed mrs kilpatrick what'll ye do with the child now she's no chance of pay any more asked mary relentlessly and poor maggie's eyes grew dark with fright as the conversation abruptly pointed her way she sometimes waked up in misery in mrs kilpatrick's warm bed crying for fear that she was going to be sent back to the poorhouse Maggie and me's got to cape together a while yet, said the good old woman fondly. She's very handy for me, so she is. We ought part without each other, whatever befalls, so we ought. And Maggie looked up with a wistful smile, only half reassured. To her, the shutdown seemed like the end of the world. Some of the French people took time by the forelock and boarded the midnight train that very Saturday with all their possessions. A little later, two or three families departed by the same train, under cover of the darkness between two days, without stopping to pay even their house rent. These mysterious flittings, like that of the famous Tartar tribe, roused a suspicion against their fellow countrymen, but after a succession of such departures, almost everybody else thought it far cheaper to stay among friends. It seemed as if, at any moment, the great mill wheels might begin to turn, and the bell began to ring, but day after day the little town was still, and the bell tolled the hours, one after another, as if it were Sunday. The mild spring weather came on, and the women sat mending or knitting on the doorsteps. More people moved away. There were but few men and girls left now in the quiet boarding houses, and the spare tables were stacked one upon another at the end of the rooms. When planting time came, Word was passed about the corporation that the agent was going to portion out a field that belonged to him a little way out of town on the south road, and let every man who had a family take a good-sized piece to plant. He also offered seed potatoes and garden seeds free to anyone who would come and ask for them at his house. The poor are very generous to each other as a rule, and there was much borrowing and lending from house to house, and it was wonderful how long the people seemed to continue their usual fashions of life 
without distress. Almost everybody had saved a little bit of money, and some had saved more. If one could no longer buy beefsteak, he could still buy flour and potatoes, and a bit of pork lent a pleasing flavor to content an idle man who had nothing to do but to stroll about town. End of Part 4 Part 5 of The Gray Mills of Farley by Sarah Orne Jewett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. One night the agent was sitting alone in his large, half-furnished house. Mary Moynihan, his housekeeper, had gone up to the church. There was a timid knock at the door. There were two persons waiting, a short, thick-set man and a pale woman with dark, bright eyes, who was nearly a head taller than her companion. "'Come in, Ellen. I'm glad to see you,' said the agent. "'Have you got your wheelbarrow, Mike?' Almost all the would-be planters of the field had come under cover of darkness and contrived, if possible, to avoid each other. "'Tisn't the potatoes we're after asking, sir,' said Ellen. She was always spokeswoman, for Mike had an impediment in his speech. "'The childer came up yesterday and got them while you'd be down at the counting-room. "'Twas Mary Moynihan sought to them.' we do be very thankful to you sir for your kindness come in said the agent seeing there was something of consequence to be said ellen carroll and he had worked side by side many a long day when they were young she had been a noble wife to mike whose poor fortunes she had gladly shared for a sake of his good heart though mike now and then paid too much respect to his own infirmities there was a slight flavor of whiskey now on the evening air, but it was a serious thing to put on your Sunday coat and go up with your wife to see the agent. We've come wanting to talk about any chances there might be with the mill, ventured Ellen timidly as she stood in the lighted room. Then she looked at Mike for reassurance. We're very bad off, you see, she went on. Yes, sir, I got them potatoes but I had to bake a little of them for supper, and more again the day for our breakfast. I don't know whatever we'll do when they're gone. The poor children does be entreating me for them, Dan. The mother's eyes were full of tears. It was very seldom now that anybody called the agent by his Christian name. There was a natural reserve and dignity about him, and there had come a definite separation between him and most of his old friends in the two years while he had managed to go to the School of Technology in Boston. "'Why didn't you let me know it was bad as that?' he asked. "'I don't mean that anybody here should suffer while I've got a cent.' "'The folks don't like to be begging, sir,' said Ellen sorrowfully. "'But there's lots of them does be in trouble. They ought to go away when the mill's shut down, but for nobody knows where to go. Farley ain't like them big towns, where a man'd pick up something else to do.' I says to Mike, come, Mike, let's go up after dark and talk to Dan. He'll help us out if he can, says I. Sit down, Ellen, said the agent kindly, as the poor woman began to cry. He made her take the armchair which the weave room girls had given him at Christmas two years before. She sat there covering her face with her hands and trying to keep back her sobs and go quietly on with what she had to say. Mike was sitting across the room with his back to the wall, anxiously twirling his hat round and round. "'Yes, we're very bad off,' he contrived to say, after much futile stammering, all the folks in the corporation, but Mr. Dow has got great bills run up now at the stores, and them that had money saved has lent to them that hadn't. T'will be long enough before anybody's free.' When the mill starts up, we'll have to spend for everything at once. The children is very hard on their clothes, and they're all dropping to pieces. I thought I'd have everything new for them this spring. They do be growing so. I minds them and patches them the best I can. And again Ellen was overcome by tears. Mike and me's always been contriving how we would get something laid up so if any one would die or be long sick we'd be equal to it but we've had great pride to see the little girls go looking as well as any 
and we've worked very steady but there's so many of us we've had to pay rent for a large tenement and we'd only seventeen dollars and a little more when the shutdown was sure the likes of us has a right to earn more than our living ourselves being so willing-hearted tis a long time now that mike's been steady we always had the pride to hope we'd own a house ourselves and a piece in our land but i'm thankful now tis as well for us we've got no chances to pay taxes now mike made a desperate effort to speak as his wife faltered and began to cry again and seeing his distress forgot her own and supplied the halting words he wants to know if there's army work he could get some place else than farley himself been sixteen years now in the picker first he was one of six and now he is one of the four since you got the new machines yourself knows it well the agent knew about mike he looked compassionate as he shook his head stay where you are for a while at any rate things may look a little better it seems to me we will start up as soon as any one does i'll allow you twenty dollars a month after this here are ten to start with no no i've got no one depending on me and my pay is going on i'm glad to share it with my friends tell the folks to come up and see me ahern and sullivan and michael and your brother con tell anybody you know who is really in distress you've all stood by me tis all the lazy ones would be coming if we told on the poor boy said ellen gratefully as they hurried home ain't he got the good heart we'd ought to be very discreet mike and mike agreed by a most impatient gesture but by the time summer had begun to wane the agent was a far poorer man than when it had begun mike and ellen carroll were only the leaders of a sorrowful procession that sought his door evening after evening some asked for help who might have done without it but others were saved from actual want there were a few men who got work among the farms but there was little steady work the agent made the most of odd jobs about the mill yards and contrived somehow or other to give almost every household a lift the village looked more and more dull and forlorn but in august when a travelling show ventured to give a performance in farley the corporation hall was filled as it seldom was filled in prosperous times this made the agent wonder until he followed the crowd of worthless sadly idle men and women into the place of entertainment and looked at them with a sudden comprehension that they were spending their last cent for a little cheerfulness End of part five. Part six of The Gray Mills of Farley by Sarah Orne Jewett. The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. The agent was going into the counting room one day when he met old Father Daly and they stopped for a bit of friendly talk. Could you come in for a few minutes, sir? asked the younger man there's nobody in the counting-room the busy priest looked up at the weather-beaten clock in the mill tower i can he said tis not so late as i thought we'll soon be having the mail the agent led the way and brought one of the directors comfortable chairs from the committee room then he spun his own chair face about from before his desk and they sat down it was a warm day in the middle of september the windows were wide open on the side toward the river, and there was a flicker of light on the ceiling from the sunny water. The noise of the fall was loud and incessant in the room. Somehow, one never noticed it very much when the mills were running. "'How are the Duffies?' asked the agent. "'Very bad,' answered the old priest gravely. "'The doctor sent for me. He couldn't get them to take any medicine. He says that it isn't typhoid.' only a low fever among them from bad food and want of care that tenement is very old and bad the drains from the upper tenement have leaked and spoiled the whole west side of the building i suppose they never told you of it i did the best i could about it last spring said the agent they were afraid of being turned out and they hid it for that reason the company allowed me something for repairs as usual and i tried to get more you see, I spent it all before I knew what a summer was before us. 
whatever i have done since i have paid for except what they call legitimate work and care of property last year i put all maple street into first-rate order and meant to go right through the corporation i've done the best i could he protested with a bright spot of color in his cheeks some of the men have tinkered up their tenements and i have counted it toward the rent but they don't all know how to drive a nail tis true for you you have done the best you could said the priest heartily and both men were silent while the river which was older than they and had seen a whole race of men disappear before they came the river took this opportunity to speak louder than ever i think that manufacturing prospects look a little brighter said the agent wishing to be cheerful there are some good orders out but of course the buyers can take advantage of our condition the treasurer writes me that we must be firm about not starting up until we are sure of business on a good paying margin like last year's asked the priest who was resting himself in the armchair there was a friendly twinkle in his eyes like last year's answered the agent i worked like two men and i pushed the mills hard to make that larger profit i saw there was trouble coming and i told the directors and asked for a special surplus but i had no idea of anything like this nine per cent in these times was too grand a prize said father daly but the twinkle in his eyes had suddenly disappeared you won't get your new church for a long time yet said the agent no no said the old man impatiently i have kept the foundations going as well as i could and the talk for their own sakes it gives them something to think about i took the money they gave me in collections and let them have it back again for work tis will to lead their minds and he gave a quick glance at the agent tis no pride of mine for church building and no good credit with a bishop i'm after young men can be satisfied with those things not an old priest like me that prays to be a father to his people father daly spoke as a man speaks to a man straight out of an honest heart i see many things now that i used to be blind about long ago he said you may take a man who comes over him and his wife they fall upon good wages and their heads are turned with joy they've been hungry for generations back and they've always seen those above them who dress fine and live soft and they want a taste of luxury too they're bound to satisfy themselves so they'll spend and spend and have beefsteak for dinner every day just because they never had enough before but they turn into wild beasts of selfishness and most of em if they had no check tis there the church steps in remember your maker and do him honour in his house of prayer says she be self-denying be thinking of eternity and of what's sure to come and you will join with me in believing that it's never those who have given most to the church who come first to the ground in a hard time like this show me a good church and i'll show you a thrifty people father daly looked eagerly at the agent for sympathy you speak the truth sir said the agent those that give most are always the last to hold out with honest independence and the first to do for others some priests may have plundered their parishes for pride's sake there's no saying what is in poor human nature repeated father daly earnestly god forgive us all for unprofitable servants of him and his church i believe in saying more about prayer and right living and less about collections in god's house but it's the giving hand that's the rich hand all the world over I don't think Ireland has ever sent us over many misers. St. Patrick must have banished them all with the snakes, suggested the agent with a grim smile. The priest shook his head and laughed a little, and then both men were silent again in the counting room. The mail train whistled noisily up the road and came into the station at the end of the empty street. Then it rang its loud bell and puffed and whistled away again. "'I'll bring your mail over, sir,' said the agent presently. "'Sit here and rest yourself until I come back, and we'll walk home together.' The leather mail bag looked thin and flat, and the leisurely postmaster had nearly distributed its contents by the time the agent had crossed the street and reached the office. His clerks were both off on a long holiday. 
they were brothers and were glad of the chance to take their vacations together they had been on lower pay there was little to do in the counting room hardly anybody's time to keep or even a letter to write two or three loiterers stopped the agent to ask him the usual question if there were any signs of starting up an old farmer who sat in his long wagon before the post office asked for news too and touched his hat with an awkward sort of military salute come out to our place and stop a few days he said kindly you look kind of pinched up and bleached out mr agent you can't be needed much here i wish i could come said the agent stopping again and looking up at the old man with a boyish expectant face Nobody had happened to think about him in just that way, and he was far from thinking about himself. I've got to keep an eye on the people that are left here. You see, they've had a pretty hard summer. Not so hard as you have, said the old man, as the agent went along the street. You've never had a day of rest more than once or twice since you were born. There were two letters and a pamphlet for Father Daly, and a thin handful of circulars for the company. In busy times there was often all the mail matter that a clerk could bring. The agent sat down at his desk in the counting room, and the priest opened a thick foreign letter with evident pleasure. "'Tis from an old friend of mine. He's in a monastery in France,' he said. "'I only hear from him once a year.' And Father Daly settled himself in his armchair to read the close-written pages. As for the agent of the mills, he had quickly opened a letter from the treasurer and was not listening to anything that was said suddenly he whirled round in his desk chair and held out the letter to the priest his hand shook and his face was as pale as ashes what is it what's the matter cried the startled old man who had hardly followed the first pious salutations of his own letter to their end read it to me yourself dan is there any trouble orders I've got orders to start up. We're going to start. I wrote them last week. But the agent had to spring up from his chair and go to the window next to the river before he could steady his voice to speak. He thought it was the look of the moving water that made him dizzy. We're going to start up the mills as soon as I can get things ready. He turned to look up at the thermometer as if it were the most important thing in the world. Then the color rushed to his face, and he leaned a moment against the wall. "'Thank God!' said the old priest devoutly. "'Here, come and sit down now, my boy. Faith, but it's good news, and I'm the first to get it from you.' They shook hands and were cheerful together. The foreign letter was crammed into Father Daly's pocket, and he reached for his big cane. "'Tell everybody as you go up the street, sir.' said dan i've got a hurricane of things to see to i must go the other way down to the storehouses tell them to pass the good news about town as fast as they can twill hearten up the women all the anxious look had gone as if by magic from the agent's face two weeks from that time the old mill bell stopped tolling for the slow hours of idleness and rang out loud and clear for the housekeepers to get up and rang for breakfast and later still for all the people to go in to work some of the old hands were gone for good, and new ones must be broken in in their places, but there were many familiar faces to pass the counting-room windows into the mill-yard. There were French families, which had reappeared with surprising promptness. Michel and his pretty daughter were there, and a household of cousins who had come to the next tenement. The agent stood with his hands in his pockets and nodded soberly to one group after another. It seemed to him that he had never felt so happy in his life. "'Jolly looking set this morning,' said one of the clerks, whose desk was close beside the window. He was a son of one of the directors, who had sent him to the agent to learn something about manufacturing. "'They've had a bitter hard summer that you know nothing about,' said the agent slowly. Just then, Mrs. Kilpatrick and old Mary Cassidy came along, and little Maggie was with them. She had got back her old chance of doffing, and the hard times were over. They all smiled with such blissful satisfaction that the agent smiled too, and even waved his hand. End of Part 6 End of The Gray Mills of Farley by Sarah Orne Jewett